to understand some of the finer points of the Dharma, especially in more advanced stages of meditation. It's often good to go back and look at the basics. Take the teaching on compunction, otapa. It's basically an unwillingness to do something unskillful because you're afraid of the consequences. It's usually paired with a healthy sense of shame. With shame, you're concerned about looking bad in the eyes of people you respect. With compunction, it's more impersonal. You realize that the way things are, if you act on unskillful motives, with unskillful intentions, there's going to be harm down the line. And you decide that you care. Right there you're combining two principles of discernment, one of which is right view, that actions do have consequences and they are based on the quality of the intention that underlies them. Then there's right resolve, which is the desire not to be harmful. It's a very basic emotion. You see somebody you'd like to hit, you realize when you hit them, okay, there's going to be consequences. The Buddha would teach this principle to children. There are stories when he's on his alms round, and he sees some children, in one case beating a snake with a stick, in other cases catching fish. And he says, do you hate pain? Do you love pleasure? And they said, yes. Then why are you causing pain to other beings? The karma that's going to come back at you, even as you run away. In other words, no matter how hard you may try to get away from it, it'll, it'll track you down. A very basic emotion, a very basic principle in the, karma, in the Dharma. But it carries us all the way through, because it basically says you do care about the consequences of your action. Somehow the teaching that you act without being attached to the outcome. is one of the Buddhist principles, but I've never seen that. Now there are cases where you have to be equanimous about efforts that you put in and are not getting results yet. But the whole teaching revolves around the attitude that you're acting because you want certain results. And you begin to realize that some actions lead to better results than others. And it would be foolish to act in ways that you know are going to give rise to, to pain. It's simply not worth it. It's a value judgment. Here again you hear some strange teachings that insight has nothing to do with value judgments at all. In fact, it's supposed to be the opposite of a value judgment. You just accept everything. But the idea being that by not trying to make anything happen, you're going to run into the unfabricated. But again, the Buddha never taught that. There are actions that are worth developing and actions that are worth abandoning. That's a value judgment. The Four Noble Truths are a value judgment. You act on craving, there's going to be suffering. So craving is something you should abandon. You act on the Noble Eightfold Path, you'll reach the end of suffering. So the path is something you should develop. The path is obviously better than craving. Now it's easy to understand that in the abstract, but a lot of the practice is learning how to apply that principle in action. As we're meditating, we are fabricating a state of becoming. So it's an action you're doing, and you've decided it's worth it. That's based on an understanding of karma, fabrication and the value judgment that the effort that goes into sitting here, looking at the breath night after night after night, is effort well paid. The rewards may not be coming right away, but you're convinced that the principle is that if you train the mind, you'll be 
much less likely to cause yourself suffering. So here you are, training the mind. And you're training it away. It tries to give rise to a sense of well-being. When you find that you can breathe in ways, and focus on the breath in ways that do give rise to a sense of well-being, you have a new standard for pleasure. As the Buddha said, for most people, they see no other alternative to pain besides sensual pleasure. So in spite of the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, they keep going back. Whereas you have an alternative pleasure when you do concentration. It's called the pleasure of form. And the Buddha encourages you to indulge in it, settle in, gain nourishment from it. In other words, he's basically saying, get attached. Get good at this, so that it becomes something you actually can hold on to. Because then that gives you another perspective on your old pleasures. You're more willing to see their drawbacks. This is how dispassion comes. The Buddha first teaches you dispassion for unskillful actions. By talking about the rewards of generosity, the rewards of virtue, and also the, the opposite of rewards that come when you act on unskillful intentions. But the rewards of generosity, the rewards of virtue are what? Rebirth in the sensual heavens. But then you go into concentration. Then you can look back at the pleasures of the sensual heavens. Even the sensual heavens have their drawbacks. You've got something better here. And when you make that value judgment, that's based on an understanding of action that you fabricate your pleasures. So I fabricate pleasures that have a lot of drawbacks. Here's someone that has a lot less. So you're showing goodwill for yourself, the desire to be harmless. In other words, right view and right resolve in action. And then you apply the same principle as your mind gets deeper and deeper into concentration. You learn to appreciate the deeper states of concentration. You compare them with the more shallow ones. You see, the deeper ones are much more worthwhile, a more satisfying place to be, even though some of the deeper ones don't have the bells and whistles of rapture or pleasure. They're more equanimous. But still, over time, you begin to realize these are better places to be. But then even they are fabricated. And it's when you can develop some dispassion for them. Not so that you would go back to your old ways, but you want to find something even better. That's how concentration can lead to the insight that leads to release. Even the insights, though, are an activity. And a part of that is going to be that once you've used the insights that pry you away from your attachment to concentration, you have to let go of your attachment to the insights as well, because they too are activities. You're finally getting to something that is not an activity. And John Munn talks about it, describes nirvana as activitylessness, akiriya in Thai. But you don't get there by doing nothing or trying to do nothing. You get there by getting more and more appreciative of the principle of action, getting more refined standards for your judgment as to what's worth doing and what's not, based on the insight that you do fabricate your experience anyhow. So try to do it well. Do it in a way that's rewarding, where the effort that goes into it is well repaid. So you start with something simple like compunction, and you find that the basic principles, once you understand the basic principles, they carry you all the way through. If you miss the basic principles, they can lead you astray. So 
So don't look down on the basics. And John Lee often said that a lot of people who study the Dharma get things backwards. They think high-level Dharma is low, and low-level Dharma is high. And high-level Dharma is the Dharma that you put into practice, starting with the virtues that you develop, like shame and compunction. Low-level Dharma, he says, is the Dharma that you just memorized. It's a guide, but the high-level stuff comes with the practice. It's like the difference between a recipe and the food you make based on the recipe. You can't eat the recipe. It's what you do based on the recipe that gives you nourishment. So look at your actions. Start from the basics. Look at the little ways you give in to unskillful mind states. And remind yourself, if you can't take care of those, how are you going to be able to manage the more advanced levels? But if you do master your impulses to do something unskillful, if you have a sense of compunction around them, that opens the way.